So, uh, I want to welcome you to the NF2 breakout session and to just very quickly to um, remind you that if you do use the CART uh, service, please move to the front. Come close. We prefer people not to be in the back, so big family here. Um, and to not spend much time on introductions, just to say that we know that one of the main issues that face NF2 uh, individuals is uh, hearing loss. And so this um, panel <coughs> is really uh, an attempt to address many of the aspects of, of hearing difficulty. So we have two uh, wonderful and talented uh, speakers today. Uh, the first, well, I don't know the order, but Matt Hay, who's a bit of a legend in our community in, in that um, he's one of many individuals who have adapted amazingly well to hearing loss and has been such an inspiration, not just for patients and families, but also uh, to physicians. And Anne Maria Ranciano, who uh, I have the great fortune of working with uh, at MGH, who works in the Department of Psychology, and uh, she and I collaborated a lot on uh, many projects related to NF and NF2. So um, I'll let them take over and I'll advance your slides. So just wiggle your ear or whatever I need to do. So um, it's a small group and both Matt and I want to keep this very informal, so please uh, interrupt us or ask questions as we go along. Um, so we have two things that we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to start uh, talking about communication issues in NF2 and hearing loss and then Matt will tell us about his experiences. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about adaptation. In terms of communication, it's important to have a definition of what communication is. Um, communication is a meaningful exchange of information uh, between two or more living creatures. Okay. Uh, so communication is really a social interaction that requires the ability to engage in the interaction. So typically when we think of communication, we're thinking about listening and speaking. But really, there's much more that goes, that goes into communication. So you're speaking, you're thinking about what you're speaking, you're listening, you're thinking about what you listen, and then you also have a lot of nonverbal communications. And when you're talking about NF2 and hearing loss, uh, you're obviously losing, you're losing the listening uh, when there is hearing loss, and maybe you're losing some of the speaking um, when there's palsy. But the nonverbal communication uh, is still present and it could um, definitely be developed even more to aid in communication. Just a funny slide here. Um, so there are obviously differences between men and women in terms of communication. This is very stereotypical, uh, but guys tend to be more direct, um, very little nonverbal communication. Um, whereas in women, there's a lot of nonverbal communication uh, present. Um, so again, uh, in NF2, when there's hearing loss uh, or speech difficulties, uh, developing the nonverbal communication can really help with decreasing the isolation and making you feel more present um, in terms of the conversation. So I want to let Matt tell us a little bit about his experiences with communication. Uh, well, I, I think my perspective here is just somebody that um, has gone through all of this and uh, I was diagnosed with NF I was diagnosed with NF2 about 20 years ago and I can remember uh, sitting in those chairs and just being scared out of my mind and thinking wait why did I even come here the last thing I want to hear about is all the bad stuff that can happen to me or people talk about losing my hearing um, so somebody asked a question earlier today about not about a husband that didn't want to come and, and be reminded of all the things that can happen with NF2. Uh, and I remember being there and I stayed away for a long time. Uh, then once I came back, I think the, the, the value I hope to bring is, you know, you've got some brilliant people to be able to share stuff and then you've got me. Uh, but, but I've been there. Uh, and I know what it's like to slowly lose your hearing and face that and then try to learn about all the different things that are uh, to help you to regain your hearing. And the good news in all of this is never in the history of man has there been a better time to be deaf. Uh, you know, between the ABI and some other things that we'll talk about today, uh, with texting and, you know, ideally you just have one of those baby 
baby carriers and carry her around in it. She'd type everything that everybody around you was saying. Uh, that's not totally feasible, but with enough, you know, the number of apps that are out there, uh, the technology, it's, like I said, there's never been a better time to be uh, deaf or hard of hearing. So there's some good news for you. In, in a weekend that you might uh, find yourself getting sucked into this drain of like, there's so many bad things that can happen. Um, so we'll pick up, I'll, I'll add some more specifics about uh, how I dealt with some particular things. Um, areas where I failed, uh, areas where I would recommend you, know, you focus on. Okay, let's talk a little bit about adaptation. So obviously when you have a diagnosis for NF2 or you lose your hearing or ability to speech, there is a period of grieving, uh, grieving the loss, feeling the emotions. And, and this is really necessary to allow you to move into uh, the process of adaptation that happens through something that's called the response shift. Uh, so there are three phases of, as part of this response shift. There's a recalibration where you want to change your internal standard of what constitutes good health. So maybe before uh, losing your hearing, good health meant not having that many medical appointments or being able to hear like everybody else. Um, through this process of recalibration, you can learn that you can have good, good health even though you have NF2 and hearing loss. Um, the second phase is reprioritization, where you adjust your values and priorities. So maybe things that were very important before uh, now become secondary. Um, and reconceptualization, where you redefine what is important in order to maintain good quality of life. Um, so this is a process of adjustment uh, that eventually can lead to good quality of life. There are also a lot of therapies available to help with the process of adaptation, um, auditory rehabilitation, um, so therapies and devices that aid hearing with a goal to overcome the disability caused by hearing loss and help with the social isolation. Um, also the nonverbal communication that we described earlier. There are many devices and therapies to support hearing loss, um, lip reading, sign language, APIs that Matt will talk to you about in a minute, cochlear implants, um, cute speech as well. Um, Amanda Berner did a study um, of about 250 people and um, she found out that 93% of people reported difficulty with communication, so these were patients with NF2. Um, the majority of them used auditory or verbal um, communication. Um, some used cute speech, lip reading, sign language, and um, about 17% at that time, which was three or four years ago, used uh, written communication, so pen and paper, computer and texting. I think pen and paper is a little unrealistic, uh, but I definitely think that probably at this point, this percentage would be much higher because we do have a lot of um, apps available and a lot of devices that can be very helpful. So how do we prevent the transition from NF2 to decreased quality of life? Because it doesn't have to happen. You don't have to um, have developed depression or, or decreased quality of life. So there are many, many things that you can do along the way. Um, there are drugs such as Avastin that help with preventing hearing loss. Um, once hearing loss develops, there are hearing aids, cochlear implants, or ABIs that are available. In terms of the impaired communication, there are many apps available, um, and Matt will talk to us about them. So speech-to-text, text-to-speech uh, translators. Um, and then in terms of preventing decreased social connection, isolation, and depression, um, mind-body interventions can be very, very helpful. Um, so we know how to do this individually with CART services. Um, what we're trying to do right now, it's one of the pro pro projects that I'm involved in, is um, adapting a mind-body intervention that I've developed um, and tested in patients with um, NF1, NF2, and traumatosis, but could not include those with hearing loss. Now to test it for patients who have hearing loss, perhaps use through the use of cards or any other suggestions that you might have here, I'm, I'm eager to learn. Um, so some of the coping skills here are acceptance of things that cannot be changed, 
adaptive thinking, so changing the negative thoughts to more positive or adaptive thoughts, um, problem solving strategies, relaxation strategies to deal with the stress and anxiety that sometimes comes, um, use of positive psychology concepts, so learning to be more optimistic, learning to use humor, um, and finding meaning, which I think is really, really important. <coughs> Um, so I'm going to let Matt now tell us a little bit about his experiences. So, <clears throat> when I was first, not everybody with NF2 is going to lose their hearing, uh, but it's common. So, one, if, if you haven't gotten to that point, don't think that it's definitely going to happen, um, but I would recommend preparing for it. Um, it would be great to learn sign language and not ever need it, rather than the opposite. Because I remember uh, an early uh, a neurosurgeon that I met with um, in college when I was diagnosed. I'm an 18 year old invincible frat guy, and now all of the sudden I've got you know these brain tumors. And what exactly is that going to mean? And and the doctor said to me, you know, you're you're probably going to lose your hearing, and it's not that big of a deal. And I remember thinking, that sounds like something that somebody with good hearing would say. Uh, because it is a big deal, but once I accepted the fact that this was going to happen, uh, all right, now what, what's the best way to deal with this? My wife and I started taking sign language classes. We started doing research on cochlear implants and the auditory brainstem implant, or API. Um, fortunately, it took me about 10 years from that time before I finally lost hearing in both ears, but at that point, we had um, sort of marginal sign language skills. Um, and I had done research on an ABI where six weeks after my hearing finally disappeared on riding an elevator at work one day. Six weeks later, I was at the House Hearing Institute getting my ABI implanted. Uh, are there um, anybody in the room that has an ABI? Uh, has anybody looked into them as a possibility or considered? Okay. Uh, you'll hear something about a cochlear but I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to get into the Overly, overly detailed, but if your hearing has, think of 10 steps, with step one being this goofy crescent shaped thing, and step 10 being your brain. A hearing aid helps with about step one or two, just makes things louder. A cochlear implant helps with maybe step five, so you've still got half of your body's natural hearing process. Your API goes all the way to step nine, which is, it connects to your brain. The less of your natural hearing you have, um, over millions of years of, of uh, you know, just evolution. Nothing is going to recreate that naturally. Um, so an API does the best that it can do. Things sound robotic, um, they're not, uh, it's not really a pure sound. Running water sounds like somebody crinkling um, uh, either cellophane or aluminum foil. So things sound a little bit off, but man, it's way better than not hearing anything. <laughs> uh, I burn fewer pizzas in the oven because I don't forget that the, the alarm's going off, you know, the buzz is going off. So even if you, you manage those expectations of what it's going to sound like, hearing anything with an API or a cochlear implant is better than uh, hearing nothing without it, in, in my experience. So if that's something that you're facing, I highly recommend um, doing research on ABI and maybe insurance and the, the things that go into that, uh, because it's definitely a legitimate, uh, I'm not cure for deafness, but it's definitely been a life-changing addition for me. Um, and I think going back to quality of life and, and managing expectations, the Hansons hit on a point I make often, which is you know, focus on what you can and what, not what you can't. Uh, for me, I can't, I can't, I don't go to concerts anymore and appreciate it, you know, I can't uh, listen to a live band, you know, in a bar and be able to pick up uh, really anything that's happening because of all the noise. So I could really get down about that. But, uh, uh, I can hear my kids say, I love you, Dad. And I take it over a bar band any day. Um, and the API gave me that, and, and the preparation and learning that went into that helped prepare me for that. So in terms of managing expectations and reprioritizing things, that's probably the best example I can give. Uh, so 
if there's uh, you know, any question anybody ever has, if this is something that you're looking at, I remember when I um, wanted to know what's it like, what's it sound like, there weren't very many, this was 10 years ago, uh, I got put in touch with two people that I think were just unhappy with life, not their ABI, and I didn't get the kind of uh, objective feedback that I was looking for. Um, I don't want anybody to ever feel that isolation with questions like that, that I felt. Um, so one of the reasons I'm here, and if anybody ever needs cell phone numbers, <coughs> don't, don't call me, but <laughs> you can text me, um, or, um, you know, email address. Uh, I'm, I'm an open book in terms of my experience or things that I really struggled with uh, or areas where I found success. So I want to make myself available to anybody in the room to that. Uh, and I think before I, if you have anything else to jump in on, uh, there was a book um, in the 70s called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that maybe some of the older crowd here has read. Uh, and and it gets kind of it gets kind of out there. Uh, but there was one line where a son asks about how hard it is to fix a motorcycle, and he says, um, "Motorcycle maintenance isn't difficult, but." Um, Having the right attitude about motorcycle maintenance is what's difficult. And I think the same thing about deafness. It's really not hard to be deaf. It's pretty easy. Uh, but having the right attitude about being deaf is, is what can be a real challenge. And I think all of the things that we, we address um, here is about having the right attitude. You know what? If it happens, it happens. What do we need to do to move forward to improve the quality of life? Is it um, getting a phone with a better text plan? Is it researching an API? Is it more mind-body skills? Uh, I use, uh, I work for a marketing company in Chicago and rely almost 100% either on uh, text, instant message, or CapTel telephone. And if you guys, if anybody familiar with CapTel, it's a free relay system anywhere with Wi-Fi that will repeat, if, if, I, if I call you, it doesn't uh, hear my voice. It routes my phone call through a, um, a business in Madison, Wisconsin. And anything that you might say to me on the phone, it runs through this person at a desk in Madison with trained voice um, to text recognition. And with maybe a one or two second delay, what they say appears on my screen. So if, if it's a one-on-one -on -one call, uh, there is very little lost. I have a little one conference calls where a lot of people start talking. Um, but things like that are out there. It's just sometimes hard to find them all in one place. So uh, I have my computer here. If anybody wants to see that, we can put my wife in. She just, I said, do you mind if I call you in front of a room full of strangers? <laughs> um, but I think better maybe to, uh, if anybody has any questions, I can show you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then uh, I'm just trying to think of the, the different tools that I use. I have an alarm clock called a sonic boom. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't bring it because last time they wouldn't let me check my bags because you don't want to go to the airport with something called a sonic boom that has, you know, I mean, you couldn't design an alarm clock to look more like a bomb. <laughs> so, uh, but this, the sonic boom is one incredibly loud. But it has three settings that you can use all at once or in combination with one another. We can plug a lamp into it, you can have the alarm clock, and then it has a vibrating disc that is vibrates strong enough that if you just put your head on it, you wake up concussed. Uh, <laughs> so if you use all three, it's sort of like waking up to a one-man band of lights <laughs> blinking, the alarm going off, and the bed vibrating. Uh, and it's great. <laughs> the, uh, there have been times where I've used it at hotels, and I uh, I'll get ready in the morning and you know shower or on my suit and get ready to leave. And the last thing I do is put my hearing aid on and realize that at 5:30 in the morning my sonic boom has just been going off for the last 45 minutes in the hotel, and there's somebody on the outside knocking. <laughs> and I, I, I'm sorry, I had no idea. Um, so those those tools are out there, and they really do every little bit helps to make uh, to normalize your day. And I would say the combination of those things um, and my ABI, I, I never would have believed this 10 years ago, but there are times and days where I forget that I'm deaf. And, and that's, I mean, the idea of that, um, that 
when the doctor said you're going to be deaf and it's not that big of a deal, I never would have believed it. Uh, so it's it's not it's not the end of the world. And you take great naps. I can nap on the plane. <laughs> so. so it sounds like what what was really helpful for you was to make the difference between the things that you have to accept and the things that you can problem solve and then using a lot of, you know, what we call positive psychology, so a lot of humor, rather than, you know, something happens at the incident with the alarm clock, you can think of, oh my gosh, feeling embarrassed and, and you know, sort of putting yourself down. But like you said, there's nothing I can do about this and, you know, making a joke about it. Um, that's, that's wonderful. So, and I, we, done pretty well staying on time. I want to uh, you know, open up to questions if anybody has anything specific. Again, I, um, I'm, I'm an open book about anything, so nothing too personal. Well, probably, probably some things too personal, but uh, NF2 here in a way that nothing too personal. Um, so does anybody have anything they specifically hope to get out of this that we didn't touch on or an area that you're particularly scared about? About how long does it take for you to really adjust to the ADI when the, it's put on and in your system? Uh, I heard all of that. Oh, uh, the when I first when I first got it, I thought, well, there's no way anybody really wears these all day because uh, things <laughs> were just incredibly muffled. Um, you start hearing sounds that you forgot existed. I can remember thinking I was being followed. Like, what is that noise? And it was the sound of my pant legs brushing against each other when I walked, because I hadn't heard that sound in five or eight years. Uh, so it took some time to adapt to uh, to just that sound that, uh, and every little bit, you know, marginal increases. Uh, and I would say now, at, at ten years after, uh, I can't casually talk on the phone. My wife and I have developed a system where I ask yes no questions, and it's one for yes, two for no, uh, because yes and no would sound very similar, but I could totally get, uh, you know, uh, are you going to be home by five? Yes. Okay. Are you going to be home by five? No, no. Now I'm, I have a clear distinction between yes no. Uh, also, I got to lead all the conversations, so the conversation was <laughs> over, I, I was done. Uh, and, and so those little coping mechanisms help, but I think from year zero to now, in, in over a decade, I can almost use the phone. My dad's southern and talks very slow, so I can, I can have a conversation with him surprisingly well. Um, he just says the same ten things over and over again, so that might be good. Uh, and, uh, but I'm at a point now where I'm very comfortable with it. But before, even riding in a car, road noise from the tires would drown out any other sound. And as you get your ear, as you get an API, you go back and you get what they call mapping, which is just updates to your program. And each time, if you've got normal hearing at this end of the spectrum and really lousy first day AVI hearing at this end of the spectrum, each one of those maps brings it a tiny, tiny bit closer so that over the course of a decade, you're now here, um, which I would consider functional hearing. And I had my AVI implanted, I'm sorry, I'm dominating here. I, I had my AVI implanted when they took out a four centimeter tumor. And I still have one on this side that's stable. We can all knock on our chairs there. Uh, and when they did the, adding the AVI, my doctor said added about 45 minutes to what was probably a six hour surgery. So getting the API really wasn't that big of a deal um, surgically. But uh, I went into it with the mentality of if this doesn't work, then they still got a brain tumor out. Anytime you can get a brain tumor out, that's a good day. So if on top of that the API works and it's functional, that's just gravy. Um, and I think that approach helped me to not be I, you know, really disappointed when they turned it on and I, and I didn't work as well as I wanted to. Um, and it's hard to say have patience for a decade, but that's kind of what I'm telling you to do. Yeah? Uh, I wonder if you could comment for everybody about what you've heard from other patients and families and also your experience about the 
challenges of learning sign language, because from a provider's point of view, I would estimate that less than 5% of people are able to incorporate that in their strategy. I, I wish uh, I wish I was more fluent in sign language. Right now I get by by saying I need more practice. And that's about all I know how to say. Uh, I view sign language or acute speech just as a foreign language, just like anything else. And this is entirely my experience. Uh, where my wife and I got to a point where we were getting pretty effective at it. Uh, but if nobody else is, you know, if, if my wife and I speak German in the middle of this room, it's still not going to help us communicate with other people. So my sign language sort of trailed off. Um, I've almost relearned the alphabet from over beers last night. Uh, but uh, I don't know anybody else that knows sign language. So it didn't benefit me. If you are in an environment where a lot of other people are signing, I think you can pick it up very quick, and I think absolutely any way you can improve your communication, go for it. Especially something that, and sign language is just cool. It's a good thing to learn. Uh, but for us, if you don't use it every day, you know, if you took a foreign language in high school, you've probably forgotten all of it because you're not sitting in a room full of other people speaking the same language. Um, but I know uh, cute speech has been effective for people. I just haven't used it. Um, and Sign is definitely, I would say, a supplement, uh, a very useful supplement to hearing. A couple more. Back to the ABI. Uh, what's the longevity? Or did they project the longevity of the ABI? Uh, I hope long. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, replaced the, uh, over Thanksgiving, I replaced the, um, like the, I don't want to say the guts to it, uh, because the power button had worn down from using it over years. Uh, but I can't imagine there are very many people out there, well, <laughs> I'm sitting in front of a rugby player, but uh, <laughs> there aren't a lot of people that treat their ABI worse than I do, between sweat and dirt and kids knocking it off wrestling, and I've, I've had very few issues with it over 10 years. So it's actually sturdier than some of the hearing aids that I have. Some of the patients implanted in the late 70s and early 80s still has usable ABI, so I don't think there is necessarily a uh, maximum lifespan. You're right. Thank you. I, I, I was thinking more hardware, uh, just because I just had to replace that thing. But internally, I have never had any experience. I don't. I haven't heard about anybody having them that stopped working. Uh, so, are you familiar with Scott? Have you had anybody that? Yeah, I was saying some of the patients from the late seventies and the early eighties still have functional ABI. Okay, and so if if, if it happens, it's an anomaly. Um, I don't know anybody that's had to have go back in. Um, people have at one time we discussed having bilateral, which I think occurs rarely. Um, but I'm not going to have another surgery <laughs> just to get an ABI. So hopefully I don't get bilateral because that means they don't have to do anything ever to this side. It's a lot of hardware too. Was there a, like a, is there a training period that you go through to learn how to use it at, with somebody? Or is that something you just did on your own? How does that work? Uh, they make software, but I, my experience was nothing was better than just wearing it all the time. Even when it was sounded too much, your brain just relearns to hear. And and the more you wear it, the the my experience was the the better it worked for me, the faster it improved. Well, please join me in, in thanking uh, Anna Maria and, and Matt uh, for this. We'll move on.